you can turn to the person beside you and say, you're a bloody legend, go. Bloody legend. Turn to the person on the other side and go, you too, go. And you too. <laughs> so the question is why you're a bloody legend. Well, the reason for that is today's Fun Day Friday. All right. And generally around about this time, people are arriving at the Thank God It's Friday Club. <laughs> getting ready for happy hour. So they've been thinking about that since Monday. Just to get through the week rather than get from the week. And they need to get to that bar and have those uh, happy hour drinks and put as many down as they possibly can to try to forget the week. And what are you doing tonight? You're coming here to the boardroom, the, the table of knowledge to better yourself, and that uh, must be celebrated. So give yourselves a clap. I'm always interested to see who shows up on the Friday. <laughs> More likely people show on a Monday, but the Friday is one of those days that is sacred to people to go and hide from the week or hide from their life. Because you can always determine um, what opportunities you get from what you do in your own time. It's what you do in what we call prime time that determines the opportunities you get in other people's time, in business time, in career time. As one of my great famous and uh, mentors, a guy called Jim Rowan, a business philosopher once said, learn to work more in yourself than you do in your job and you become more valuable in everything that you touch. So congratulations for coming here on the Fun Day Friday. How many people do you think were invited today? Lots. Now, we sent out a, an email to thousands, and how many showed up? Not lots. <laughs> but who does show up are the people who are the most passionate at the time. And the question I'm going to ask you, and the challenge I'm going to ask you, in one year's time we run another executive club, how many of you are going to still be at this table? Because what I see over life is a uh, an evolution of people that come, they're all passionate, they get going, and then they just drop off. And I don't know where they go. Maybe they just get busy. Maybe they've got so many clients making so much money that they have come. They don't come to a day like today. Because what you do in your prime time is going to determine your longevity in this industry. And I've been fortunate enough to be in this industry for 28 years. I started when I was 17. And one common thing which I share with people, if you want longevity, then you have to keep recreating yourself. Nothing stays the same. You have to continually recreate yourself and position yourself uh, in the marketplace where you're going to be most valuable. And one of the major contributing factors that determine how valuable you are is your knowledge. So here's a great way to start. I want you uh, to become what I call intelligently ignorant intelligently ignorant because many people become intelligently arrogant where arrogant means they think they know it all therefore they don't need to learn anything more so what they too tend to do is just gain a lot of experience which is really one year of experience repeated many times I want you to write this down common sense is not very common and leads to nonsense. It's important that you continually step out of yourself to look back in yourself to see where you are and where you're going. Because if you keep looking where you're going from where from the inside, you tend to get confused in the process. So sometimes step out, look back in and say, okay, where am I going? Where's my career going and what do I have to know? Who do I have to become to get what I want? That in itself will always keep you ahead of the pack. You don't want to become a part of the pack, you get smothered in there. You're going to be ahead of the pack. And sometimes it's important to lead your own pack. Create your own vision and let people follow in behind you. But many times it's so easy to get busy in any career that you get so busy doing the wrong things. Or get busy doing the things that are taking the wrong direction, taking you nowhere, or you just get busy running on the spot. 
So we always have to measure, you know, am I going to where I want to go? And be careful not to get wrapped up in the crowd. If you're doing everything else, if, if you're doing, if what you're doing is the same as everybody else, I would have a challenge with that. If you look like everybody else, dress like everybody else, do what everybody else does, then you're blending in to what everybody else is doing. And one thing I've learned, most people don't know what they're doing. Most people have actually no idea what the hell is going on. And the biggest challenge that a lot of people have in their careers is they underestimate themselves and they overestimate other people. So be careful never to underestimate yourself and never overestimate anybody. Because we tend to pump people up for who they're not. We go out there in the street and we think everyone knows what they're doing. Believe me, they have no idea. You know why I have no idea? Because 95% of them, by the age of 65, are broke. If they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be broke at age 65. 95% are doing what they don't want to do, have a job, which stands for just over bro, hate their work, Monday they hate, Friday they love. So if you're following everybody else, you're probably going in the wrong direction. Sometimes you have to have the courage to stand alone and do what you want to do. And because common sense is not very common, if you follow your common sense, you probably step out of that pack. And I'm going to go through some things tonight which people accept, but when you think about it from the outside in, you think, that's just crazy. That makes no sense. And I've been fortunate enough to be in this industry for 28 years and seen a lot of crazy things. <laughs> and people just accept it because every, every other idiot's doing it. Five million people doing a stupid thing doesn't mean it's not a stupid thing. And you're going to be exposed to an industry that are full of stupid things. Because there are a lot of stupid people in the world, and many of them come into the fitness industry. <laughs> it's important that you measure where you are and where you're going. And make sure that you're not following the wrong person. I'll use a classic example. There's a, a gentleman I from New Zealand, one of our international fitness prof professionals, Ming, M-I-M-G. Ming is built like Andrew. Big Mari, but you know, like Andrew, a lovable type of guy. You know, just like a big teddy bear, but huge. So Ming comes out of the program, he's done the business, he's going, man, this is great stuff, this is great stuff. So he goes into the health club where he gets a job as a membership consultant, salesperson, as some people call it. So he takes on board what we share with him. So he starts wearing good pants, shiny shoes, shirt, you know, a button-up shirt, tie, suit which is completely what everyone else is not wearing because everybody else is wearing little people's clothes. You know those people who wear their little brother's clothes? Because <laughs> they want to show their lumps and bumps and want to come across looking like a condom full of walnuts. <laughs> or the ladies, in, the ladies, ladies in, the, in the gym are wearing as smaller clothes as they possibly can so they show as much cleavage and cracks and backs as they can. <laughs> I don't know. But he, he thought, I'm going to dress professional. All of a sudden, he started to draw a lot of attention to himself from the rest of the crowd, and they, what do you think they were saying to him? Yeah. Why are you dressing like that? You don't have to dress like that. And Ming wanted to become a personal trainer. At the gym at the time, there were five personal trainers. He was a membership consultant. He started to uh, take responsibility, become the best membership consultant there, and because he was producing the great results, the manager put him in charge of a body for life type challenge in the club. So he took it in, in charge of that. And he, he rang me up one day and he says, you know, this is amazing. I was standing there and uh, a, two ladies came up and they saw me at the counter. We were talking about personal training and they said to me, are you a personal trainer? I said, yes. And because I was dressed in long back pants, back of the shoes, back of the belt, a real nice shirt and a name badge, they said, man, you're the person we ought to train with. Because you look so professional, so professional, knowledgeable, you're exactly who you want to train with. And he was just amazing. That just a presentation of professionalism drew so much of a positive attention from the right people. What do you think the other personal trainers in the club were saying? Why are you dressed like that for? And what are they wearing? Short shorts, dirty sand shoes, odd socks, faded shirt, wondering why they're not getting any clients. But what was interesting is that the Challenge for Life built, all the people, contestants, wanted to train with me. So in that uh, Challenge for Life, he ended up getting up to 40 clients, personal training clients, in a very short period. We're, we're, I'm talking within a matter of weeks. 
He said, I, I can't train them anymore. I says, okay, man, I don't even ask. <laughs> I don't, I've never asked to train anybody. They just keep coming up to me. He says, can I train with you? Can I train with you? What was amazing is the challenge, I remember I came into the college and it was just before I had to go into coach and um, uh, Ashley, who was our admin angel there, says, Kerry, can you call me? It's really, really urgent. So I had a quick five minutes. I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, Ming, I've got, you got five minutes. What's going on? He says, they hate me. He says, who hates you? He says, all the trainers. They're all rebelling against me. They're not doing what I asked them to do. And I says, welcome to the land of success. <laughs> I said, congratulations. What do you mean? He says, they hate you. Isn't that awesome? And, I says, and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, let me guess. You got most clients, right? He said, yeah. He says, how many clients you got? He says, oh, in, well into my 30s. I said, Congratulations. He says, how many other trainers are there? He says, oh, there's five other, other trainers. And he says, how many clients do they have? He says, well, collectively, the whole lot have 15 clients. <laughs> 15 clients. I said, so tell me about the other trainers. He says, well, one's been there for five years. A couple's been there for four years. One's been there for three years. And one's been there for two years. And the most any one of them had were five clients. And that's one who's been there for five years. It says, five years, one client a year. Wow, what a, what a road to success. Of course they hate you. You've taken one month to get 30-something clients, and they've taken five years to get five. Of course they hate you. It's called jealousy. <laughs> They'd rather criticize what you do rather than examine what you do, particularly when you're getting the results. Try to pull you down. To work into the land of success. That's the way it seems to be. The poor criticize the rich. The unsuccessful criticize the successful. The poorly dressed dr criticize the well dressed. Isn't that amazing? The ones who can't go on holidays say, oh, I don't really want to go on holidays, says the person who wants to go on holidays. The person who has no money says, oh, I don't need money, says the person who has no money. Oh, the industry is full of too many personal trainers, says the person who has no clients. Welcome to the land of success. Why you have to do something which is opposite to, to everybody else. Sometimes you just reverse it. See what they're getting, and if they're not getting much, do the opposite. Think differently. Have the courage to step out of the box and think for yourself. And also be able to analyze yourself and step, look in on yourself, say, where am I going, how am I going? It's easy to follow. And sometimes you're following down the wrong path. Who here has done group exercise or what we used to call aerobics? Anyone? Yeah. You know, or know what it... Well, I was fortunate enough that in, in my early career, um, my manager, in a way, persuaded me to uh, teach aerobics. My passion was weight, weight training, but somehow I sort of fell into this hole of aerobics. And uh, so I did a course and I became an aerobic instructor, which is really interesting. And I hadn't had much exposure to it, except that it was mostly female instructors, and they used to wear very little clothes. That's where they were lycra back in those days. They were lycra with the G-string on the outside. Now, it was quite pleasant to the eye for a bloke, but uh, you know, pretty uh, painful if you had to do it yourself. But I became an aerobic instructor, which is quite interesting. And uh, in that journey, uh, a lot of my uh, friends at the time who were... Uh, my football mates, martial art mates, boxing mates, you know, who, you know, that's to say, you know, you're an aerobic instructor, what, what's wrong with you? Yeah, you, you're a girl. <laughs> and at first I was to think, okay, fair enough, that's a fair enough point. But after a while getting, been in that industry, I, I found the fringe benefits of being a male aerobic instructor. Because when they used to give me a hard time, I said, well, that's, that's fair enough. You can give me a hard time, but think about what I do. I go into a room, and back then, aerobic classes were like about 100 people in a class. I go into a room, there's 100 women wearing hardly any clothes on, and they do everything I tell them to do. <laughs> that was just the most amazing position. I said, you go and play football. You go and have a shower with your mates. <laughs> and, I go, and I get invited out to tea and coffee with the girls. How cool is that? <laughs> so I remember my first class, because I didn't really know how to teach it. And uh, my first class was in the public holiday. I showed up for the class and I went uh, rugged, we used to call ruggers, big rugby union pants, uh, baggy football dacks, and a uh, big baggy t shirt. And I used to have these uh, KT26, Dunlop KT26 shoes with the tractor treads. I remember those ones, and I'd, I'd footy socks. Yeah. Yeah. South Sydney Rabbitohs on one side, and St. George on the other side. <laughs> And I had this tape, remember those tapes? You see them in museums now. 
had the tape and I spent all the night beforehand with my records, the big, you know, those big, you see them in museums as well. And I used to record the music onto the tape. And then I'd have the series of songs and that was my aerobic tape. And my first class would have had probably about 100 people in it and I'd put the tape in and switch on the thing and off the rest of it, okay. And the, the room was packed, all women, a couple blokes. Right. And uh, I said, okay, run, run it out, run. And I said, everyone's running on the spot. I says, keep running, keep running. Come on, knees up. Come on, you mongrel, knees up. Come on, don't watch it. And they run around the room, and everyone's running around the room. And I'm in the middle just yelling and abusing them. And <laughs> I'm just going into football mode, you know, burpees, 100 star jumps, sprints up and down, relays. And that was about it for the whole class. And over time, the class kept growing. And I started attracting more blokes. And I was a hit. I thought I was a movie star or something. It was quite amazing. <laughs> and this, this class just kept going and going, and it was, it was huge, hugely successful. It was at Pindara Sports Clinic. It's no longer there. It was a massive uh, sports centre here on the coast. And I started teaching classes around the place and was quite successful. And being one of the very few moral roving instructors on the planet, let alone uh, on the coast, then I became in quite great demand. And then I remember, you know, it was all going well, and I was probably teaching a handful of classes a week, but my real passion was weight training. But I remember getting this flyer, and it was called the Fit Aerobic Tour. And it was all about the new style of aerobics coming out from the United States. And I said, okay, fair enough. And I was fairly insulated where I was. I didn't go to many gyms. There's only two gyms I taught at, and that was it. And uh, my manager said, why don't we go to this workshop? I said, well, fair enough. I go to the workshop. It was at the Inderpilly Workout in Brisbane, uh, which is run by a good friend of mine, Michael Burke, one of the best health clubs in the country if you ever go and visit there in Brisbane, in the Inderpilly Workout. Inderpilly Workout. I'll explain a little bit later about it, but it's a great health club. So I had this aerobic work workshop at the Inderpilly Workout, and I show up and driving up, and I remember pulling up into the um, driveway in my little Datsun 180B rush bucket. Just fortunately, blessed, thank you for getting me from the coast to Brisbane. <laughs> you know, the temperature gauge is up and smoke's coming out, but I got there. And I hopped out and I had, uh, I'm walking towards the door, and in front of me I see this bloke walking in front of me. And I thought to myself, what on earth is that? And this guy is wearing full body, fluorescent, electric blue lycra outfit. <laughs> Completely lycra, and it had these, but had these little straps in the bare chest, and he had the big flop socks, and he had the the fringe with the uh, colouring, the blonde colouring, which wasn't a thing for blokes back then. You know, blokes spent so much product on hair back then. Blokes, you did product hair, oh you, oh come on, what are ya? Right, that's when, it was quite interesting. And had this this hair was waving in the wind, like this. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is that? <laughs> and I followed this bloke in, and he was going to the Fit Aerobic Workshop. So I go through the gym, and at the back there's this beautiful aerobic room, sprung floor, wooden floor, like a dance floor. I open it up, and he goes in, and right in front of me was just another hundred of them. <laughs> like, mostly women, but blokes. <laughs> All in this light graph, they look like a big cage full of canaries. <laughs> and others yellow and orange. And I'm there with my footy dacks, my baggy t shirt, my, my, my KT26s. And I, th I felt like I was a Rottweiler walking into a poodle party. <laughs> and everyone sort of looked at me and sort of, you know, look at this, who's this guy? This guy's obviously in the wrong room. He's got to go to the, to the gym. But I walk in, I said, I'm here for the aerobic uh, workshop. I said, okay, fair enough, and I feel a bit odd, but the lady who ran the thing, a lady called Lexi Williams, she was beautiful, she came down, she saw I was a bit odd, you know, thorn amongst the roses, and she came down, she says, oh, I'm Lexi, welcome, come in, and I said, fair enough, so there were probably, I don't know, probably about 60, 70 people in this room, or, and they were the elite, or supposedly the elite of aerobic instructors, you know, they were the what, the, what they called the superstars, so I found out, because remember, I didn't really know what was going on with aerobics. So she gets up, she puts the music on, and she says, okay, let's do uh, some, some aerobics. So I said, fair enough. So I'm in the middle. And uh, she goes, okay, everyone march it out. And everyone in the room marched in synchronization. They're like, and they're, doing, they're marching like this. 
You know, it's like, and I'm sort of doing the army march. <laughs> Looking around going, God. Then, then she says, grapevine. And I thought, grapevine? And the whole, whole class just, in a synchronised manner, just go. <laughs> I'm going, what, what's going on? What's this grapevine thing? And I'm sort of trying to go back and forth in the organic synchronisation. I'm bumping into people. And then she goes, okay, flick kick, flick kick. And everyone does this beautiful <laughs> flick kick. And I'm kicking footballs, <laughs> trying to work out, moving forward. And they go star jump and they, you know, they get in the star jump where they go. And they're doing all this stuff. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And they, they do it so beautifully and fluently and dancey. And, uh, you know, and I thought, wow. What's, and I was sort of challenged by this. I felt real odd. So I'm going to get this if it kills me. So before you know it, I'm sort of starting to get it. And, I'm, and I get through the day. So I got introduced to what we call choreography. So freestyle choreography. And I learned how to count to eight. Because <laughs> the dance, I'll get this, just go, five, six, seven, eight. And I'll say, why don't they go, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten? <laughs> so I learned about the music slicing and the phrasing. And it took me a while to get it, but I started getting it. And uh, walking out there quite confused, but thinking, this is, this is how things are going. This is the in thing. This is the new aerobic. So I go back to my class, and I put on the tape on, and I say, okay, Ryan, I'm going to teach you a grapevine. And everyone goes, what? A grapevine. Ready for this? And so I'm taking them through how to teach this, do this grapevine. So before you know it, I'm out there doing grapevines with everyone. And, this, and then I'm doing flick kicks. You know, you flick forward, and... You're doing this, and, and everyone's sort of, yeah, they're sort of getting, and the blokes sort of going, what is going on here? But over time, I sort of get encouraged, and I'm getting a bit of, uh, you know, excited, and my grapevine started to, to change. You know, so, you know, first, it's just a standard grapevine, right? And then you'd have a, you wobble the head a bit, and then you might even go with a little stand, you know? you know? And then you may, at the end, flick on the outside. You know, you go like this. And the, everything started changing in routines. You do side kicks like this. And, and, I'm, and then I noticed that over time my clothes started to shrink. Because <laughs> I started getting into the culture of aerobics. Before you know it, I'm wearing white pants. And, and it wasn't long before I'm wearing the full, you know, ho ho. <laughs> With the sock down the front. <laughs> I became so much in the culture, I got sponsored by Reebok, because Reebok was a big sponsor. So twice a year, I get this big box with a sponsor gear, like track suits and shoes and the full works, because I became to teach instructors how to teach, teach aerobics. So I became a teacher. And they'd send me my Lycra outfit. It came in like an envelope. <laughs> and there it is, you know. Fluorescent green is in this year. <laughs> Put the little Lycra outfit on, it had the little belt and little microphone and, and off you go <laughs> and I started as I'm doing it I started getting a bit of encouragement particularly from the front row because I'd do a grapevine and someone in the front row would go whoo and I'd go whoo and I'd go whoo and I'd go whoo before I know it we'd go whoo 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 with sound effects something like something off chorus line or the movie it's, and I, I, I said, wow, man, that was a great movie you did there. You know how you did that great find with a flick at the end and you spun the back door. That was fantastic. And they would, they would do stuff in the front row. And I'm sort of getting into this. And then you go to more workshops, another aerobic workshops, and you learn new things. And you're sort of getting into it. And I'm just like, yeah, this is good. This is good. I like this more challenge. I work out choreography and new ideas and all sorts of stuff. But what I found over time is that my classes started to shrink. What do you think happened to the blokes in the class? Yeah. He's, he's poofed, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the people who just came for a workout and they couldn't, they're not very coordinated? What happened to them? They weren't. What happened to, say, Mrs. Jones, who came into the gym? She's been shown a tour for the gym by the membership consultant. Say, so, hey, this is a robot class. And I see this big, thuggy looking, canary dressed up bloke at the front with little clothes on, jumped down. She's going, I'm not going down there. Yeah. <laughs> so my classes over time, without even realising it, because I was getting acknowledgement from the wrong people, the frustrated aerobic dancers uh, at, the, at the front, 
because I started you get the dancers down the front who think they can do it better and then they start to woohoo you and they become instructors and you should become an instructor so we sort of inbreed ourselves with other dancers when I retired from aerobics probably eight years after that uh, my classes were down to probably 10 to 20 and that when I retired was considered a big class but when I started just ah, on the spot the real simple stuff the classes were in the hundreds so what's interesting is that something so simple was made so complicated by what you call a expert or the star aerobic instructor and so I was involved in actually destroying the aerobic industry and it still has not recovered you know Les Mills has done a fantastic job of reviving it if it wasn't for Les Mills he would be dead, dead and dusted but Les Mills what do they do they brought in a program which is simple and the same every week when I taught every class was completely different I had trouble keeping up with it how do you think my class were trying to keep up with it so it was an interesting learning curve being involved in becoming the expert becoming so complicated actually losing your client as I said my passion at the time was not really aerobics even though I engaged in it there was lots of fun and had lots of good times drank lots of tea and all that bit but my real passion was strength training that was where my, my passion was and in a similar nature my career in strength training went down the similar path for a while now when I first started strength training I used to work as a gym instructor at the gym on the coast not here anymore but way back then it's called Bob's Gym in Southport I used to go there after school and uh, supervise the gym in the afternoon because Bob would go home in the afternoon have his growth nap because you know, he's a real bodybuilding type gym they would have his snooze who asked me because I was there all the time to, to look after the gym and I got into weight training because a friend of mine at school Sean Rain his cousin came over from Canada and he was a, a bodybuilder his name is Jeff Olson he was about 19 20 years of age and I was only about 16 17 and I met him at a party and I said man look at the bumps on you where did you get all those bumps this guy had lumps on lumps on lumps so I lift weights I said okay he said why don't you come down to the gym so I went down to the gym and started lifting weights and I got hooked on it being a young bloke with good genetics full of testosterone I just lumped up pretty pretty quick got strong very quickly and I was right into it so Jeff sort of took me under his lap taught me the ropes of uh, strength training and a lot of the stuff he taught me was really simple we just did the the big lifts that's all we did and I just focused on getting strong and strong and strong and I got really strong at a young age I was benching three plates aside with ease and uh, all my other lifts were you know a lot stronger than most people in the gym and I got hooked on it so at that time I thought well what I'll do is I will um, this is what I really want to do for the rest of my life so I went and uh, enrolled at university and did a university degree in human movement studies and learnt a lot about nothing really got taught about people who've never done much and <laughs> but I got through it learnt the anatomy forgot it all the, straight after the exam never really understood it uh, never really did any sort of exercise in the university degree, very theoretical, but I came out with the letters after my name that people thought I was an expert and thought I knew what I was doing. I still kept doing a lot of weight training because I didn't get taught in the university regarding to the application of any of the theory which I was taught. I didn't even understand the theory, I just memorized it, regurgitized it, and then forgot it. That all my learning really came in the trenches. So I started reading lots of magazines and reading lots of books and all the bodybuilders and all that stuff because there wasn't much out there in research or science not that I really would understand it anyway at that time and I you know, worked from there to another gym called uh, Spartan Gym then I worked at another gym called Lifestyle Health and Fitness Club where I became the um, the gym manager supervisor type thing or the and they named me the exercise physiologist Mm. because they wanted someone with the degree to do all the fitness testing because we were right into fitness testing back then because you learn it at university so they applied it in the industry which really means it scared the crap out of most people and you know, doing body fat tests and MBO2 tests and really they wanted to just there yeah, lose weight turn up and look a bit better and we're doing all these tests on them because that's what you learn at university so I became the exercise physiologist so I had this lovely badge near the exercise physiologist you know with the, with the degree and people put me up on a uh, dismantled as if I knew what I was talking about and in that journey I kept lifting weights and I started um, getting into bodybuilding so I competed in bodybuilding and because you're young and you train hard and you follow the you know all the principles you're always going to get a good result you know, when you're 19 20 years of age you're always going to get a good result no matter what so all of a sudden I'm, I'm buffed I'm lean 
I'm an exercise physiologist, I'm the gym manager, and now I become this, what you call this expert. And very quickly, I'm this expert. Now the challenge, the definition of an expert is that and when you become an expert, you stop learning. I didn't understand that because sometimes you, know, you have to get, you know, the day after the day that you realise you don't know it all is the day when you start learning. But at that stage in my early years that because people built me up and I looked apart, had the name, had the degree, you know, had the, I guess, the aggression I suppose to become successful, that I became the expert. And that's where my learning stopped. My mind just stopped learning after that because I was now the expert. I'm the gym supervisor. I'm the, which is an interesting case. So my my goal for you is not to become the expert, because yeah. an expert is a, you know, wore a drip under under pressure, isn't it? Yeah, a little spurt. Mm. You don't we not much get through it. Particularly this uh, arrogance. Well, I came across as arrogant, which is really ignorance combined with fear. So. Arrogance is a, a weakness. When you come across someone as arrogant, it means they have low self-esteem, they're ignorant, and they're fearful. That's why they come across aggressive. So don't be scared by arrogance. Have pity on arrogance. Because yeah, you're never going to get anywhere. So it's like the, uh, you know, the earth. What, you know there was a time in life where people thought the earth was, was flat? Do you understand that? They thought the earth was flat. Now, we all know it's round. But a guy called Christopher Columbus, I remember I was in Portugal at an international conference, so I was uh, presenting at this international conference, and in Portugal is where Columbus did all his training. And uh, he came up to the king and queen of Spain and said to them, he says, you know, I think, based on my explorations and my evidence, that the earth is not flat. I believe the earth is round. Now, how do you think the response of the Spanish people and the king and queen of Spain comment at the time. Yeah, right. right? Lunatic! <coughs> Lunatic! And you can just imagine, it says, come here Christopher, have a look. Look, it's flat. It's not round, it's flat. However, he, he was passionate enough and believed enough that the earth wasn't flat. Because people back then thought if you sail uh, west, because civilization was in, you know, in uh, eastern or western Europe, if you sail west, you're going to sail off the edge of the earth down to who knows where. So everyone was fearful to sail west. Now his, his proposal was if, if the earth is round and we sail west, then we'll come around to India or Asia where a lot of the trade and riches are. Because they had to cross uh, very rough terrain to trade with India. But if you just go across the ocean, it's easy. Therefore, to the king and queen of Spain, you're going to become richer like you've never imagined because it's going to open up the trade between the East and the West. But obviously the king and queen weren't convinced, so they actually asked their experts, their leading scientists of the day, and said, so this Christopher Columbus thinks the Earth is round. What do you think? And what do you think their advice to the king and queen of Spain was? The guy's a lunatic. He's crazy. But Christopher, he's a persistent gentleman and continually tried to sell the idea to let him explore uh, West. And it was some 10 years it took him to convince them. And he was an outcast. He used to laugh at him and mock him and think he's a bit of the, the lunatic. But eventually he irritated, I think, he irritated the king and queen of Spain. They said, oh, we've had enough of this guy. How about we get rid of him? The best way to get rid of him, let him sail west off the edge of the earth. So they gave him a fleet of three, three uh, boats, or big galleons, what they used to be called. And his biggest challenge then was to get a crew of sailors to sail with him. <laughs> you imagine the headline, sail west off the edge of the earth with Christopher. <laughs> like, who's going to volunteer for such a thing? They think it's suicide. So he couldn't find any sailors. So the king and queen of Spain helped him because they probably wanted to get rid of him. I, don't, I wasn't there, so I'm adding K-Man's little slant to the story to make it a bit more interesting for you. <laughs> and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right? But there is some truth to this. Um, they got, got a crew for him by releasing convicts out of the jails. So now, not only has he got a sailing crew, but they're all convicts, murderers and thieves and all sorts of stuff. But they were just happy to get out of the jails to get on the boat. Maybe they might be able to get a bit, a bit of freedom. So Christopher heads off. Right? He's got his convicts on his, on his boats and he's heading west and the king and queen of Spain going, see you later. <laughs> oh, bye. <laughs> 
So off he goes. And I don't know how long he, he was sailing for, but he sailed for many, many months sailing west. And it got to the stage where his crew was getting a little bit edgy. And they thought, you know, this is, this is not good. We're going to sail off the edge in, in any day now. We're going to sail off the edge. And so there was a mutiny, and they were going to, uh, you know, walk the plank or cut his head off, whatever they do on there. And he said, look, just give me one more day. I sense we're going to hit land. One more day. And they gave him one more day. And he says, after that, if I don't reach land in one more day, I will walk the plank and I'll grant you your freedom when you get back to Spain. But if you don't give me one more day, you go back to Spain as a convict and you throw him back in the jail. So they gave him one more day and, as the story does, they hit land. And what country did they hit? The America, United States of America. <laughs> Hence, they, when they landed, the Americans saw the natives. They thought they'd hit India. So when they saw the natives, they called them Indians. Mm -hmm. See, the American Indians, where they thought they were from India. That's how they got the name Indians. They thought they were Indians, but they weren't really. They weren't from India, they were in America. So obviously his, his theory was correct, but it took the courage of one person to go against the whole world to say that the Earth was flat. Now we all know who Christopher Columbus is, not because he blended in, and agree with the experts, but because he actually believed and stood firm for what he believed in. And many times in your life, you're going to have that decision. Do I do what's easy, or do, do I do what's right? And what's right is very rarely easy. And in life, you only ever have two choices, in all aspects of your life. The choice is to do the easy thing, and do the right thing. And many times the right thing is tougher than the easy thing, but it gives greater rewards, and you can look in the mirror, you don't blend in. So, yeah, history is, uh, you know, if you ever study history, it's, it's, it's clouded with all these, these situations where people went against the grain and, and looked, no, that doesn't make any sense, that's not right, but because everyone else thinks it's right, everyone thinks it's right. Like Galileo, Galileo was, uh, was the first person to suggest that, see, back then, uh, because in religion, God created the earth. Then the earth was the center of the universe and everything went around the earth. Therefore, the theory was the sun went around the earth. And Galileo said, well, I think, based on looking at it from a different angle, is that the earth goes around the sun. Because he was going down the river in a boat and he looked at the bank and it looked like the bank was moving, the boat wasn't moving. Therefore, he said, well, maybe looking at it from a different angle, it's very different to what people really think it is because it's always not what it seems. So when he suggested that, they put him under house arrest for 10 years because it went against the religious beliefs of the time. My message is that if you have people criticising you for what you stand for, then you're probably on the right path. You're probably on the right path. In my career, I've been the centre of criticism all my career. All my career. And I'll share some of those with you. But it's, if, you, if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. If you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. But you've got to have some foundation to stand on. <laughs> and that's where people tend to forget what is the foundation, what are the fundamentals. And even you, it's important to address and challenge the fundamentals. Challenge everything and accept nothing. And never fully accept it because it could change. Yeah, there's a couple of things guaranteed, three things guaranteed, tax, death and change. <laughs> so change, and it's best for you to create your own change rather than life force change on you. It's, life forcing change on you is, is painful. But you creating the change is not painful as long as you can put up with the crit criticism and cynicism from others. But many times criticism and cynicism from others is the greatest compliment you can get. Because criticism and cynicism from people who want what you've got is a compliment. So when someone says, well, we don't do it that way around here, what I want you to say is say, good. You want to say it to me, go, good. good. <laughs> that's, the, that's not how we do it here. Good. good. That's not how we've always done it. Good. Because anybody who's ever created anything of significance has gone against the grain with good reason. With good reason. Never judge anything because you don't get what you judge. Never judge anything. Explore everything. Explore everything. Explore all religions. Explore all beliefs. Explore all theories. And keep the mind open rather than become the expert. Because when I was that gym instructor, gym supervisor, whenever my word was challenged, I always defended it furiously. Now, that's not right but never actually thought about it. I just said, that's not right, that can't be right, that won't work, that's silly, that's stupid, without going, well, tell me more about that. 
Tell me more about that. Explain that to me. How does that work? Rather than just defending it. Really important. Keep your mind open. Otherwise, you won't last. You become, you know, you become a, you be, a, you be a relic in a museum in 20 years' time. Be aware when people say, I've got 20 years of experience, because that could be one year of experience repeated 20 times. What I want you to be is intelligently ignorant. Every day, you're ignorant about everything to keep your mind open about new ideas. So, interesting journey. In that early part of my career, I did lots of different courses and just accepted other people's views without actually questioning them. If they had a, a bigger degree than me, I accepted it. If it was published in a bigger magazine, I accepted it. And so, well, it must be true, it must be true, it must be true. I've been very fortunate that I've been taught lots of lessons. And a lot of the great lessons I've learned have not been from experts. They've been from completely ignorant people who have absolutely no understanding of anything, but they say, but they've got what we call virgin eyes. Virgin eyes means they have no idea, they've got no history, no tradition. They just look at it and see what they see. It's not clouded with their emotion, they're not clouded with their history, it's not clouded with their expertise, it's not clouded with their, you know, any sort of emotional influence. They just, so it's really important to have virgin eyes. It's interesting, in my career I've, I've worked with uh, many Olympic sporting teams and, as a strength trainer and, and national sporting teams. And people say, so did you, did you participate in that sport? And I said, no. I never, it, most of the teams and athletes I work with, I never played their sport, which is really a good thing because I never brought any baggage with me. I just saw it purely from a anatomical, physiological, logical, common sense point of view, not from, well, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way I used to do it. Well, I never used to do it because I've never done it. Therefore, you see it, you see it with fresh eyes. You want to keep fresh eyes. Be careful that you don't get defensive or judgmental or bring your history to stop your your future. But one of the, the gentlemen which uh, really changed my life is I got into personal training. And um, at the time I was uh, had a, running a, a business called Sports Elite where I sort of look after elite athletes and uh, national sporting teams. So I got a lot, a lot of opportunities early on because I put myself in that position. And I started opening up the services to uh, the general public. And so I started doing personal training. And one of the guys I trained was a guy called Ian. And I remember, remember training him because the results that he got, which he shouldn't have got, which is very interesting. He came to me and said, look, Kerry, I wonder why I put on muscle. Uh, I used to do weight training a long time ago when I was young. He was about 27 years of age when I was young. He used to do a lot of weight training. And I want to, you know, buff, buff up again. I said, I can do that for you. I can do that. And he says, fantastic. And I said, so all you need to do is you need to train with me three times a week. Right? And I will do about an hour weight training workout. And I can guarantee you're going to get fantastic results. Okay? He says, fair enough. He says, there's only one challenge. I said, what's that? He says, I can't train three times a week. I said, why not? Because at that time, I was training five times a week with a split bodybuilding program. I said, well, I don't have time to train three times a week. I said, well, how serious are you? I said, well, I want to get, get results, but I have a young family, I have my own business, it's a building business, so I still work in, in, the, in the, the work site with the lads, lifting you know, bricks and all sorts of stuff. So I work six days a week, 12 hours a day, I have a, a wife and a young child. I don't have time to train three times a week. I said, oh. He said, well, you have to train three times a week to get optimal results, because that's what I was taught. Through all the magazines, all the books, and then what I went down at, down at uni. He says, well, I can't do that. He says, well, how many times can you train? He said, two times a week. Two times. I said, okay. He says, well, as long as you understand that you won't get as good a results on two times a week as you would three times a week. With three times a week, you get great results. Two times a week, you get okay results. Once a week, you just maintain. Okay? However, let's start with two times a week, and when time frees up for you down the track, we'll up to the three times a week. How's that sound? He said, Okay. Do you think time freed up down the track for it? Yes. No, but I'm an optimistic bloke. You understand that that's all I did. I just weight trained. You know, the, the biggest decision I had to make in that day is, you know, what time am I going to have my workout? I was just focused on weight training. And therefore, the, the, many times, the routine that I did myself, what did everyone else do? My routine. Work for me, work for you. <laughs> <laughs> you do what I do. You get what I, my results. The woman will come in, so I'll lose weight, turn up. Fantastic. 
four day a week spirit bodybuilding program. <laughs> so I can't do that, why not? What's wrong with that? It's my philosophy, because train hard or go hard. Train long or go hard, just be serious. So we start training. So we used to train on a, a Monday and a Thursday, full body routine. And his routine went something like this, and this would have been a standard uh, routine of the time. And these are the standard uh, programs I was writing at the time, which is probably less than most at the time. I would be doing, uh, we start with a, a leg press, and then we do a, a leg extension, so you get a definition in the vastus medialis, leg press for the size, then we do, got to work the, the, the hamstrings, you get a bit of shape, the leg curl, and then we do the, the bench press, because the bench press gives you size and depth. Then we'll do uh, some, maybe some pec deck to get a bit of a cleavage, really important to get a cleavage and definition, and then we'll do a wide grip lap pull down to give you that big, uh, you know, that hang glider look. Then yeah, we'll do some seated row, because that will give you depth in the back. Then we'll do some shoulder press, so we can get a bit of width in the, in the shoulders. You don't want little tiny shoulders and a big chest, it looks really odd. And because then you want some work the medialis, get a bit of definition. So we do some dumbbell lat raise. Dumbbell lat raise, get some striations there, otherwise you've just got these big lumps there. Uh, then obviously we haven't any arms, so we've got to do some bicep curls because you wouldn't want a big chest, big lats, big delts, little pinned arms hanging out. <laughs> so we'll do some barbell curls. Then we've got to do some triceps, don't oh, want big biceps and nothing on the back, so we do some tricep extensions, <laughs> tricep extensions, and then we'll do some uh, calf raises, calf raises, and then we'll come out, uh, go do some abs, go do some abs, go do some crunches, that works the upper abs, then we go do the lower abs, you want definition there, nothing down here, so you do some reverse crunches for the lower abs, and then we'll do some back extensions, I'll give you a bit of strength in the back. We could, you know, ideally you do that three times a week. You do three sets of 10 to 12 repetitions. So that was the, the, the program that I would put the average person on. And, um, and that was small compared to what I used to do. So we started training. And I found that a couple of things happened with Ian. He used to really frustrate me. He used to... Um, he always come train on the Monday, but he seemed to cancel the Thursday. And I get really, because I want to get good results. He's one of my first personal training clients. I have athletes, but he's my first personal training client. And he'd cancel on the Thursday. I said, Ian, what are you cancelling? Well, you can't cancel on me. We want to get this result here. We can't, you, you, you. I'd be thinking, geez, he's probably shrinking right now. <laughs> if he has, sometimes he have a week off. I go, oh my God, I want him to recognise. He'd be this skinny little guy losing all the muscle coming off him. Because I was taught that after three days, you start losing muscle tissue. That's why you get to train, weight training once every two days. You start losing muscle tissue after the third day. If that was the truth, most of the world would be invisible, wouldn't they? <laughs> so on average, across the first year, he would train once a week. Once a week. The other thing which I found fascinating is that when he did come on the Monday, he was always late. He'd always be at least 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes late. He'd rush in late, but he'd always have to leave on time because his wife would be waiting for him. So when he did come in, whilst we had a bit of a chat and we'd get, get going, we'd only have probably half hour, 25 minutes to do the work. I had time to do the, the core big exercises. And we never did the biceps or anything, because we never had time to. I wanted to do them, believe me. I wanted to do the biceps and the deltoids and all the crunches. I said, well, when you get home, make sure you, you know, curl your baby a few times and do some crunches in the shower, whatever it might be. He said, yeah, right. Did he ever do that? No. So on average, he would train only once a week by accident, and he would never do all the, the smaller exercises. He would just do the core ones. But what started happening is I thought he wouldn't get results. I thought, geez, I'm wasting his money. He's not going to get results. I thought he's going to start shrinking. He'd be actually smaller at the end of the year than he was at the start. But what happened? He kept getting stronger. He would have a week off. He would come back stronger. And I think, geez, you'd be sneaking workouts. <laughs> he go, nah, yeah. And not only did he get stronger, he got... He started getting bigger. Because I used to measure everything, you know, bicep and chest and head, almost everything, anything. Like <laughs> But he went from 87 kilos, he went from 87 kilos to 101 kilos. 
and he had no fat on him in the course of the course of a year because he's, he's in the trenches brick he's laboring his bench press went from just over one plate aside to three 20 kilo plates aside with reps at the end he was chinning with 50 kilograms hanging between his 220s and the 10 with a chain to do chins his size, his arms increased by five centimeters each arm. He didn't do any bicep curls. Guys, at, it was called Body Line, uh, uh, Body Line Health Club, out in the rang, I used to train him at. Guys would come and say, man, what are you doing with the arms? You know, what are you do for out here? These news arms. He says, nothing. He says, oh, bullshit, mate. You must do something. He says, nothing. Piss off. Leave me alone. <laughs> He's a fairly abrupt type of goer. So he started getting these fantastic results. I started to think, why is he getting these results? This is going completely against everything I was taught, every magazine I read. So I started thinking, well, maybe I should go back and look at the fundamentals. And actually, in hindsight, the best results I got out of lifting was I was training with Jeff where I just did the basic lifts. The more I complicated my routines, the less results I got. So I started to question everything which I was doing at the time. I started going back and thinking, okay, what are the fundamentals of what I do? What are the fun? Justify, why do I do this? Why do we do this? So I started to ask the most important question of why? Why? The question that people tend to forget. Why? Be great at asking yourself that question. Why? Another great, great question is what for? What for? What am I doing this for? What for? What am I going to get out of it? And I start to challenge that. And many of you, yeah, you already know where I'm coming from because you've been embedded in with the college and the thoughts, the processes. So I started going back to the fundamentals. Now, they call them the fundamentals because so the fundamentals don't particularly change. You know, if I grab this pen and I drop it, which way is it going to go? Down. Down, right? If I said to you, look, I'll bet you 100 bucks. If I drop this, it's going to go up. Would you bet me 100 bucks? Hmm? 100 bucks on the table. Ready? This will go up if I drop it. So you think my name's David Copperfield or something? Or, <laughs> you know? There's a good chance <laughs> that's going to go down. That's called gravity. That's a fundamental law of physics. It goes down. And there's some fundamentals in anatomy that won't change over time, not in our generation anyway. Maybe over evolution in a million years, things might, might change depending on the environment. But in our lifetime, there's going to be some fundamentals that will stay the same. So when you look at things, never forget, what I want you to do from a fundamental, take the fundamentals out rather than looking in. Because outside the fundamentals, people put what we call window dressing. Different training methods all surround the fundamentals. So you, you sort of get wrapped up in looking from the outside in rather than the inside out when it comes to the fundamentals. You have the fundamentals, you, they're your core, and then you apply them out. And if this doesn't make sense, then you break it off anyway. So let's have a look at strength training and let's redress some of the fundamentals. Now, I know you've all heard this already, but you never hear a good thing too many times. Right? And that, another part of learning is always keep re-listening, relearning the same information because if you relearn it, you look at it from a different angle. You know, it's like um, Einstein. In his second, his students in his second year of university of physics, at the end of the year, he gave them the their exam at the end of the year. And the students came up to him after the exam and says, Einstein, I think you've made a mistake. And Einstein says, well, well what do you think that my mistake is? And he says, you've given us the same exam as last year. And he said, that wasn't a mistake. The exam is the same, but you are different. So I expect different answers. If you ask yourself a question when you're 17 and ask the same question when you're 40, what's important, you're going to find there should be different answers because you're going to be a different person. If you have the same answer, you're not growing. Right? So keep asking yourself the same question. Otherwise, you just hold on to the same answer, which is probably outdated. Keep asking. People say, never be what I call a Kia. You know what a Kia is? I know it all. You know, you can identify a Kia, you know what they always say? I, heard, I know that. You know, that's Latin for I'm a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Oh, really? <laughs> when all is said and done, more is said than done. 
We all know far more than what we do. Imagine if you had done everything you wanted to do for your whole life, where would you be right now? Imagine if you did everything you said you're going to do. Imagine if you did everything you said you're going to do all your life, where would you be right now? You wouldn't be sitting here, would you? So it's not about knowing, because knowing turns you into an ed educated derelict. Sometimes I ask the same question, gets you thinking, say, well, maybe I should be doing something about this. The fundamentals. The fundamentals would change. Because you change. I certainly hope so. All right. Here, here's some fundamentals. In strength training, what's the main purpose of strength training? Get, strong. Get stronger. Okay, so if I first have to understand strength. Strength's great because it's a good measuring stick. Live in the numbers, not the story. The story is, oh, yeah, that feels really good. That's wonderful. A lot of the things can feel good, but it doesn't do any good. Sometimes the things that feel good actually do the opposite. Sitting down on the big sofa feels good, but it's not actually losing weight for you, is it? You're getting you stronger. It <laughs> feels good. So, understanding strength, and the beautiful thing with strength is easily measured by numbers. How much you can lift, how many reps you can do. Live in the numbers, not in the feeling. Because sometimes you attach the wrong outcome to the wrong feeling. It feels good, but is it doing good? Sometimes we attach the wrong outcome to the wrong feeling. So, strength. <clears throat> The old saying, nothing changes, nothing changes. Well, if the strength doesn't change, nothing's going to change. Your body is an adapted organism that rebuilds itself over a period of time, and it rebuilds itself dependent upon the stimulus that's been placed on it. So it adapts to the environment, as if I go in the sun, I get sunburnt. And then the body gets sunburnt, and then it adapts to it, and it gets a bit of a tan, and you know, even with myself, I can get a tan. It lasts for about an hour, then it just fades away again. Right? And some of us get tans easier than others. Right? But your body adapts to the environment. So you've got the sun, and your body adapts to it by building a, a tan to protect yourself from the next day of sun, and so on. If I rub my skin, I build a callus to thicken the skin to protect myself from the callus. So if I lift weights, I put a stimulus on the muscle, and it gets stronger to protect me from that weight for tomorrow. So the body's always trying to make itself stronger to make things easier. So the goal is not to make things easy. Make things harder and the body becomes harder. Make things harder and the body becomes harder. That's a nice little phrase to share with your clients. Pick the hard way because it will make you harder, not the soft way. Don't take the easy option, take the better option. Two choices, you've got the stairs or the escalator. Which one is the easy one, the escalator? Which is the harder one, the stairs? Which one's going to do more for your butt if it's hanging a bit? The stairs. Not the escalator. There's a good friend of mine, Lisa Curry Kenny, who once said, he says, if you want to lose your butt, get off it. So strength. <coughs> you want to get stronger. Now, the increase in strength happens quite dramatically if you haven't done much beforehand. You get a quite significant increase in strength if you haven't done much strength training. The weaker you are, the stronger you can get. So someone says, I'm not very strong. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> isn't that awesome? We're going to get strong really quick. Isn't that awesome? So you always turn things into a positive. People like to focus on the negative, what they haven't got rather than what they're getting. If you haven't got it, man, that means you're going to get it real quick. How awesome is that? You're going to get great results really fast. Why? Because you haven't got anything. How good is that? So your first increases of strength are from what types of adaptations? Neurological adaptations, so the first dramatic increase in strength for the first two to three months of strength training from neurological adaptations. So what, what are the neurological adaptations? That's a good question. Write down three. Write down three neurological adaptations that occur in the body that enhances your body's ability to express force and strength. Write five. Five neuromuscular adaptations occur in the body that increases the body's ability to express force. Who's got five? Okay, you are ready for an embarrassing moment? Yeah. Who's who's already done the program? Hands up. Why haven't you got five? Here we go, I want you to do this. Go. Okay, now do it when I kick. Ready? Go. Again, one more time. Oh, bugger, that feels good. Just do that again. All right? You've done the program, but you don't know that stuff. Isn't that amazing? 
So some of you may be sitting there, yeah, I've heard this before, but I'll just prove you don't even know anything. Because that's the fundamental of strength training. That's called a fundamental. That's not knowing your gravity. You're going in teaching people how to lift weights and you can't name five neurological adaptations that increases your body's ability to express force. It's a fundamental. And you've probably heard them before, but you're just somewhere out there at the moment. What I say, you go, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You see, a lot of people think they know it, but they only know it after someone tells them. So a lot of people think, yeah, I've heard this, but before you heard it, you didn't know it. Because me saying it reminds you of it, and you go, yeah, well, you've got to keep it, the information at the surface. It's not accessible down here, deep down in the memory banks that, that get retrieved when someone else sparks it. You have to keep everything at the surface. And why do you have to keep it at the surface? Because you may need it on a regular basis. And how do you keep it at the surface? You've got to keep turning it. And you've got to keep going over it, even if you think you know it. So, here's a couple of, a couple of them. We'll throw some, who wants to throw some out? Put them on the table. Okay, increase in the number of motor, motor units. So your body, muscles are motor units, you increase the number of motor units that have been activated because a lot of them lay dormant. If you don't use it, you lose it. What else? Anyone else want to add another one? This is called a humbling moment, right? <laughs> I haven't even got to anatomy yet. I'm ready with my stick. What about the cells, like re repairing and building? Okay. A part of it is uh, increasing muscle size, but that's not neurological, that's what the what muscle builds up. Yeah? What about pathways, so new pathways form through the neurological? That's increasing the number of motor units, so activating the motor units that have been laying dormant for quite some time. Increasing the frequency of firing of those motor units, so the number of new impulses that get sent down the motor nerve. Number of messages per millisecond. Increase or enhance the synchronization of activation of those motor units. So they activate in a synchronized manner, not in a haphazard manner. I'm not going to go into this, this is basic anatomy. It means they, they, they activate in a coordinated way, not a uncoordinated way. So what did you call it again? Synchronization of activation of the motor units. Desensitization of the sensory organs. Desensitization, the decrease in the sensitivity of the sensory organs. So what are the two sensory organs in the body? Golgi. The Golgi tendon organ and the muscle spindle. So, in, in expressions of force, the thing that you decrease the sensitivity is the Golgi tendon organ because it's a protective organ or there to stop the muscle from generating too much force. disinhibition of the antagonist muscle. So the antagonist is the opposite muscle that tends to protect the joint from the agonist muscle taking over. So this one contracts, if I contract bicep, tricep will co-contract to protect the elbow joint. If I put a load on it, it really co-contracts because it goes, what's going on? The bicep's trying to pull the, the radius off the humerus, so it co-contracts it. But once you get used to it, the tricep goes, okay, I'm used to this now, so I'll let the bicep do its job. Preferred activation of your fast twitch motor units. Preferential activation of your fast twitch. Means because your fast twitch has been laying dormant because you haven't used them for quite some time. So you activate the new pathways of the fast twitch muscle fibers. So there's a good starting point for you. Once those adaptations, you can, most of your strength gains will be occurring the first three months of training. One, after that, they tend to lever off. And after that, any further increases in strength come from muscle hypertrophy. Muscle hypertrophy of laying down proteins in the muscle. By stimulating the satellite cells in the muscle that trigger the laying down of the amino acids to build the muscle size. So most of your gains in strength initially have neurological, any further gains in strength after that, any further gains in strength after that, particularly for men, not so much women or children or the mature and motivated, will come from laying down more muscle tissue. Women will get most of their strength through 
neurological as would children because they're not they don't have a hormonal environment high in testosterone human growth hormone to lay down muscle tissue and as mature and motivated as you get older your levels of testosterone and human growth hormone decrease as well so that's the fundamental now if you want to lay down more muscle tissue what do you have to do get stronger right if you want to lay down more bone mineral, get stronger so the trigger for all the other physiological adaptations occur in the body is strength it's a fundamental if you're not getting stronger nothing's happening all you're doing is repeating what you've been doing so the goal in in, in weight training is to get stronger we tend to lose sight of that many times we tend to get wrapped up in the process of the latest training technique and forget what we're actually trying to achieve. We try to complicate it with the latest training tool, but we, don't, we forget the fundamental of what we're trying to achieve. We enjoy this new skill, but we don't get any stronger. So the first fundamental is strength. Second fundamental is you want to keep getting stronger. That's called what? The progressive overload principle. So if your level of strength is here, you have to apply a stimulus, which is a load, a stimulus, beyond what the body's normally accustomed to, to shock the body, what you get is a decrease in performance, which is called fatigue, and then you go through recovery, replenishment, and that will lead to overcompensation, where the body will start laying down more amino acids, become more synchronized in activation of its motor units, open up more faster muscle fiber pathways. So this is the supercompensation or referred to overcompensation. Once your body's adapted there, what do you have to apply to it? Again, a bigger stimulus to come down. So this is the supercompensation process where you apply it a load, let the recovery process take place, regeneration take place, allow for the overcompensation and then hit it again. And each time you want to, your goal is to keep going up, whether that's physiological changes in strength or, or cardiovascular fitness, which has a whole different arrangement of uh, physiological changes in uh, hemoglobin concentration or uh, number of red blood cells or diffusion of oxygen through the lungs or whatever it might be. So principle number two, not to forget, is the progressive overload technique. I, I highlight these because this is what people forget. <laughs> They get in the industry and they get busy doing stuff that's taking them nowhere. Give it fancy names, you get a feeling attached to it, but it doesn't actually get you to where you want to go. Number three, number three, fundamental, never to forget, is the relationship between intensity and volume. So in the training components of a program, you want to manipulate these components which is intensity and volume. Intensity is how hard you train, volume is how long you train. Integrated into that is recovery, naturally. So here's the basic fundamental. There's an inverse relationship between intensity and volume. I mean, the harder you train, the less you can train. Someone says, I trained a long time, you didn't train very hard. So, oh, I just came back from a two hour run. You didn't run very fast. <laughs> you don't run fast for two hours relative to how fast you can run. So, strength training, you can train long or you can train hard, but you can't do both. You can't train long and hard. Because to train long, you have to decrease the heart to pace yourself through. And we'll talk more about that in strength training. But the most important thing in strength training is the intensity. So the intensity activates the physiological components in the muscle that's going to lead to the adaptation process or increased strength. So strength is low, and we're going to talk more about that. So they're the three fundamentals, never, to give, never, never, never ever to forget, and understand a deeper level of how they occur, which you would have been exposed to throughout your program, but you probably forgot. Would that be correct? Yes. All right, so understand that when you learn something or you hear something, out of, out of tonight, you will retain probably 5% of what I say. What I want you to understand is the philosophies of what I say because you never forget the philosophy. When you read a book, you won't remember the content, but you will remember the context. For example, if, who here's read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? If I said to you, write down five major points of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I guarantee you'd struggle. Yeah, you'd probably write, uh, 
there's a rich dad and there's a poor dad. That's <laughs> good, that's the title. Uh, probably, and you probably will struggle to get 10 points. But you understand the philosophy of it. So you don't remember the content, but you feel the context. So sometimes you read a book, it's important to get involved in the context. That sparks the curiosity where you want to learn more. Because you won't retain much of it. But if you understand it, that will stay with you. So it's really important to understand what you're doing and have a philosophy attached to it. A philosophy in your exercise, philosophy in your life and how you, in business we call it a mission statement. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the components of a program. Everyone standing up, let's just give a bit of an energy break. If you're sitting on your bum, and your bum tends to widen when you sit for too long. Okay, everyone on the spot, spinning on the spot for 10 seconds. Ready? Go. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, five jump squats. Go ten. Who did ten? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, have a seat. All right. <laughs> Your learning capacity is based on how much your bum can endure, right? <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look at some components of a program which I started to question after training with Ian. Because what I didn't understand is how come we got these results with so little training? How did that happen? So I went back to the textbooks and what I realised, the textbooks were written by academics who never trained anyone for one. A lot of the principles in there aren't referenced from a scientific reference, means they're not attached to any form of research. They're just someone's opinion that they learnt from their teacher who they learnt from their teachers, it gets passed down the textbooks and because it's written so often and it's so widespread that people just believe it blindly. So when I started looking at, well, where's the research to prove this? I couldn't find much because there wasn't much at that time. There's a lot more now, but even then, research many times is limiting and many, can, many times can be, how can you say, misapplied uh, to a desired outcome where someone's emotion seems to lie. So... <clears throat> Let's have a look at some of the, the fundamental principles of uh, programming. And we've already gone through the, the fundamentals. Get stronger, right? Progress. And understand the relationship between intensity and volume. And you're going to be on the right track from a fundamental point of view. So first principle is, well, might be frequency of training. Because when I trained Ian, who's only training on average once a month, sometimes once a fortnight. Who's here had a week off and come back stronger from the training? Now, you, you, you call that a fluke or phys physiological effect? <laughs> well, to me, I think, well, I don't know what's going on there. It must be a fluke. But it happens so often that people have a week off, they come back stronger. So what have they done in that time frame in their, between their workouts? Is their body is adapted, it's recovered, it's become stronger, it's overcompensated. It hasn't gone backwards. Because when I first was taught about frequency training, the recommendation is you have to train at least three times a week. Three times a week because you, know, you have to train every second day because after the second day you start losing muscle tissue. So theoretically you had a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You train on a full body program on the Monday, a full body on the Wednesday and a full body on the, the Friday. And what I was trying to force on people is that big long program which I shared with you before, which I gave to Ian, which he refused to do because of the limitation of time. And he was, I was forced not to do it. If I could, I would have forced it on him, believe me. So the theory was that why do you need to uh, train two days after? Well, it takes two days for your body to recover. And after two days, you start to lose muscle tissue. And that's what I was taught. You start losing muscle tissue and your body recovers after two days. What I also recall is when I was at university, when I was in my physio physiology lecture, not the programming lecture, the physiology lecture, when does muscle soreness peak? 48 hours. So in one lecture they were saying, hey, you need to train every second day because after the second day you start losing muscle tissue. And the other lecture, which is the scientific lecture, on the research on physio muscle physiology, it shows that muscle soreness, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, peaks after 48 hours. But maybe because one was measured in days and one was measured in hours, people didn't sort of see the conflict between the two and the contradiction. I certainly didn't. I just assumed that, that was right because that's what everyone else is doing. So technically speaking, if you train on the Monday, when should your 
peak muscle soreness occur if you train hard on the Wednesday. If you train on the Wednesday, when's it double peak again? Friday. Thank goodness for the weekend. What's interesting is that if you continue training that hard progressively with intensity, what's going to happen? Is that going to lead you down the path to success? Because when you apply a overload before the body recovers, what eventually happens? I remember when I was in grade 10, I used to do gymnastics. And uh, so you get the rings and all the, all the, the apparatus. So when you do gymnastics, what happens to your, your skin? Oh. Yeah. Now, because I was really keen to get good at it, because I wasn't really good at it to start with, I used to go to every, every day on the, on the high bar, the horizontal bar, swinging around and doing the rings. And I kept rubbing these hands, and the calluses built up nicely, but eventually I kept rubbing and rubbing what happened to the calluses. They started to rip off, crack, and before you know it, I'm strapping my hands up, because I'm rubbing, not recovering. So the stimulus is the rubbing. What has to occur after the rubbing? The recovery. If I keep rubbing and not recover, what do I end up doing to the skin? I eventually wear it down to the bone, where I start to get the result that I don't want. If I want to tan, I go out in the sun, I get a bit of sun, I come inside, then I let my body recover, maybe put tomatoes on my skin, whatever they do these days, with all the creams and all sorts of stuff. Then when I'm sort of recovered, I go in the sun again. I don't go out there and spend 35 degree heat and spend five hours out there the first day, because I'm in a hurry. <laughs> and do it the next day and the next day. What I'm going to do, I'll actually wear the skin down and there's going to be side effects. So if I'm applying a stimulus, whether it be the sun or whether it be the rubbing, or whether it be a weight, and I apply it again before the body's recovered, if I keep doing that over a long period of time, what's going to eventually happen to the body? Well, I build it up or break it down. I eventually break it down. It will build up quickly initially because most of the changes at the start of the program is neurological. So you're going to get strong even if you're training incorrectly because there's neurological things occurring and you've got lots of potential to improve. So the thing that tend to saves me and saves a lot of people in the industry is that if you look at the, the statistics, there was some done back in the, uh, in the 90s, out of 100 people who join a gym who start a weight training program, how many people come back the second time to do it again? 52% come back the second time. How many people come back the third time to do that weight training program again? 25%. How many people continue a weight training program across a year? About 11%. This is stats back in the, in the 90s. And now, the, how, how often does 11% train on average? How many times a week? One times a week. Now, there are there people who train six times a week, of course there are, but if you wrap it all up, look at the average, it's once a week. What, what was I programming people to do? Three. Three times a week. Even if it's physiologically, scientifically correct, people aren't doing it anyway. What's the best program you can write? The ones that people do. I don't even change it, the ones that people look forward to do. Look forward to do it. So three times a week, physiologically doesn't make any common sense or scientific sense, and logically from a lifestyle point of view, how many people are going to do it? So by the time people get to the weekend, most of them have stopped doing the program anyway. Because I've written this program, it takes about two hours to do, and they're bored. Now, weight training is not a spectator sport. It's not like an Olympic sport. Well, let's get the stadium and the TVs and watch people do weight training. It's not really exciting. You may love it, but the average person finds it very, very boring. So what you have to do is design it so people are going to enjoy it. It's quick, it's easy, and it's sharp. And it's going to get the results that you want. But for even from a scientific point of view, that's not going to work. How long, if you look at measurement of muscle soreness, which is not the only measurement, but if you do that, how long can muscle soreness occur or delayed onset muscle soreness? How long can it last for? Four days, five days, in extreme cases, seven days? So muscle soreness is only one indicator because what is muscle soreness? What is DOMS? What causes DOMS? The expansion of the muscle that puts pressure on the nerves. Yeah. So if you look at the muscle, the sarcomeres under a microscope when you've done a heavy eccentric working, workout session, it looks like all this disruption in the um, micro disruption in the muscle, of like micro tears. It swells up, pushes up against the nerve endings and gives that sensation of pain, which a lot of people mistake for other things. So what you've done is you've caused microscopic damage. Therefore, once the soreness is gone, it doesn't mean the microscopic damage is gone because there are some people who don't get sore, so that's why you can't use DOMS as the only measurement. Because some people don't get sore, they still get the muscle disruption, but it doesn't push up against the nerve endings. 
So if the sauna settles down after day three, day four, you still need the overcompensation process to take place. That could be another couple of days on top of that. So if you want to have a, a safe fat, you're looking at, you can capture it all probably within about seven days. Now they have some earlier research showing that you don't actually start losing, get, losing strength until up to 21 days after your workout. Hence people can have one or two day, two weeks off and they come back stronger. Why? Because the body's still recovering all that time frame. If you look at the original research that showed that you lose muscle tissue after two days, it was incorrectly, uh, how can you say, shared. Because when you look at it, it wasn't interpreted correctly. What it showed is, is a study using bicep curls. It showed that after, after doing bicep curls, the body overcompensates, it lays down more muscle tissue. So it lays it down its peak it peaks at the rate of laying down muscle tissue two days after, and after that, the rate of laying down muscle tissue starts to decrease. It didn't say you lose muscle tissue, it decreases the rate of building muscle tissue. So you may say, if, we, if you're looking at a bricklayer, for example, a bricklayer may lay, say, 1,000 bricks a day, the second day, 1,000 bricks, the third day, 900 bricks. You're still laying bricks, it's not laying down the bricks, meaning the amino acids of the body. The, Fourth day might be 100 bricks. So you're still laying down tissue. But it's interesting that when you read original research and its interpretation and how it's been passed on, it gets completely changed. And it being completely interpreted as you start losing muscle tissue two days after, when it's actually you decrease the rate of laying down muscle tissue two days after. It's really interesting, I'll share a lot of other things when you go, go to the research, its interpretation is completely different to what it actually is. Many times it's the opposite. Because it's like Chinese whispers. Someone reads it, shares it with someone, before you know it, it's, by the time it's gotten through the industry, it's completely the opposite. There was some research back in the uh, uh, days when we were looking at fat burning zones and so on, which I was involved with a guy called uh, Professor Gary Egger. And we sort of shared this idea about the fat burning zone, but it just went to this level and degree which is completely misinterpreted. And the industry's putting fat burning zones on their cardio equipment. But if you look at the research, it never actually said that. But the whole industry just grabs it, runs with it, and changes it. And before you know it, because everyone else is doing it, but no one's read it, they all believe it blindly. I'm asking you not to be one of those blind people. You're a professional. A professional knows this stuff. You know, be curious. So, therefore, if that was the case, how often, if it can take up to seven days, how often, if you train hard, would you go into the gym and do a full body workout? Once a week. What determines how often you train is obviously your recovery. But before, even before that, it's going to be what? What other things are more important than your recovery? Your goal? Time you, have. Time you have, desire, lifestyle. All those things always trump science. <laughs> People's life always trumps science. So you've got to go, how often can you train? How often do you want to train? Because they may have plenty of time, but they may not want to train that much because they're not really desire it so much. So there's all these other factors you have to take into effect before you start and go apply the science. So when you work out the life, then you apply the science the best you can to their life and then you design the program that way. But from a scientific point of view, you know, strength training might be one to two sessions a week for someone who just gets started. If someone's doing much more than that, you have to start to question how hard they're training. Like, what are you actually doing? Because if you've been training three times a week, you're probably not putting much in. It means you're recovering really quickly because you're not doing much. Your rub on the skin is like this. <laughs> That's why you can do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And we'll talk more about that. You know, if you really want to build a callus, that's not going to build a callus. If it does, it's going to take a long time. If you want to build a callus, there has to be a, a certain amount of friction, a certain amount of sun. You're not going to get a, a suntan in the fridge. <laughs> It's interesting, here's so I remember I was presenting at the National Coaching Conference down at the Australian Institute of Sport many years ago. And I was asked to present on uh, it was increasing sport performance, train less. And I was presenting in front of about 200 coaches, from national level coaches from the Australian Institute of Sport to even suburban level coaches. So it was a, quite a, a mixture of level of coaches in the room. So the, even the title was quite interesting, increase sporting performance, train less. So a lot of people came to the session. And uh, Ro was there, and it was, funny, fun, it was the most funniest day, because you have 
the suburban coaches who are you find who are really open to learning, then you have the experts who are the experts. Now I worked with the Australian Institute of Sport for a number of years and this is after I moved on from there. But there were experts in the room, which I would find very fascinating. But I asked this question to everyone. I said, if you were training an Olympic 100 meter sprinter, we do a lot of weight training as you know, because they're, they're pretty buff and they're very strong. How long out from the Olympic final would you stop them from lifting heavy weights or lifting weights? What would be the time frame you'd taper them and let them fully recover for that 100 meter sprint which they've been training for for four years to get their peak performance? And what do you think the answer was? Generally across the board out of 200 coaches. Um, yeah, they said it was anywhere between two to four weeks. Two to four weeks. I said that's, that was the range. Two weeks out to four weeks you'd stop any heavy weight training because it's going to affect their performance. I said that's true. I agree with that. And they see them going, yeah. I said so I'm just a little bit curious. If it takes, if you're going to taper them for two weeks, what you're really saying, it takes two to four weeks for the body to fully recover from that last heavy weight training session. Would that be correct? I went, yeah, yeah. And they're thinking, where's this going? <laughs> where's this going? I know I've been set up. I said, so if you just, uh, just admitted that it takes two weeks for the body to fully recover, why then, during the season, do you weight train them three times a week? Why during the season would you overtrain them so you can taper them for the major event? Does that make no sense to you? Or am I just living on another planet? Not a whisper <laughs> in the whole room. So naturally I went through some basic physiology with them, which probably most of them had forgotten from university, which I had, I admit to, but I sort of reinvigorated that knowledge. Therefore, technically speaking, if, you, if they've got all this other stuff on their plate from training and skill and all that sort of stuff, then why would we try to force three heavy weight training sessions on them if we know and we just acknowledge that it's going to hinder their ability to recover? That makes absolutely no sense. What was really, really interesting is I got a question from a guy in the back of the room. I remember he used to be my athletic coach when I was at school for all places, and he was uh, head of the, one of the, um, uh, the, the Special Olympics. And he said, he asked me this question, his name was Chris. He said, Kerry, in this room we have the leading strength and conditioning coaches in the country. I said, yes. So therefore, why aren't they doing this type of training? I said, that's a good question. Probably best asked to them. The point is, they were in the room, but no one said anything. No one questioned it, because you cannot question anatomy and physiology. How can you question it? Because that's a fundamental. No matter how you wrap it, the core is the core is the core. And when I, I presented this, literally dozens and dozens of international conferences in front of hundreds and hundreds of coaches and no one's questioned it. No one said, well, you know, you have to train three times a week because how can you explain it from a physiological point of view? A good question that we tend to not ask ourselves. So, what I did find in that room, for example, the people who were most open to learning were who? The up and coming coaches. They came up after me in droves going, oh, now I know why my athletes are so bloody tired. <laughs> I've been pushing the living daylights out of them in the, in the gym. So, how many times a week? Maybe as you get stronger, you may come down to once a week if it's a full body program, if you're training all the muscles in the one session. Remember I was training a, a couple guys called Andy and Phil. I used to run all the personal training um, uh, systems out at Century Cove Rec Club. I used to look after five international hotels, run all their personal training with the team of trainers. But I was at Sunshy Cove, which is one of the clubs I was to run, <clears throat> and uh, there were two guys in there, and I used to train, I used to train about probably 20 people a week just at Sunshy Cove outside my own studio. And they were Phil and Andy, and I always remember them because they called them, you know, the gym called them the grunters. I thought, you know what, they're really noisy when they train, like, you know, so they warm up. <laughs> you know, lots, lots of noise, lots of attitude. And I remember meeting Andy in the change room after one of his sessions. Now they'd come in probably five, six days a week, because I was there a fair bit. And they'd train for about two hours, and they'd do this lots of exercise. I'd been there for two hours, and they were really serious trainers. They'd be really focused and grunting a lot, making lots of noise. And I was in the change room, and I sparked up a conversation. So, how's training going? He said, oh, fantastic. He's standing looking in the mirror. I go, fantastic. 
that's, that's awesome. So, so I'm just curious. You train really hard, and you seem to be very dedicated because I'm always seeing you here. He says, "Yep." I says, "What?" Well, I'm just curious. What's your goal? I says, "I want to put on muscle." I said, "Really?" He says, "Yep." I want to put on muscle. He says, "How much you want to put on?" He says, "I want to get to 75 kilograms." Now he's quite a skinny little guy, but hardly no fat on him. I says, "So what are you now?" He says, "I'm 65." And he's ripped. 65, I want to put on, going to get to 75 kilograms. I said, awesome. How long have you been training for? He says, two years. <laughs> he says, what weight were you when you started? He said, 63. I said, oh, 63. So you put on two kilograms in two years, and you seem to be training, what, four, five, six times a week? He said, yep. I said, are you happy with that? He went, come think about it. <laughs> I said, so how long do you think it's going to take you to get to 75 kilograms if you're putting on an average one kilogram a year? <laughs> and also taking into fact diminishing returns, you get less changes over time. Could take you a while, wouldn't you agree? He went, yeah. I said, okay, fair enough, have fun, and I walked off. So I left all these, these question marks in his head because I wasn't trying to convert. You don't try to convert a Buddhist to a Catholic in one meeting. You know what I mean? Because many times training is religious to people, particularly when they've been doing it. The longer they've been trained, the more of an expert and religious they are about it. What was interesting is that afternoon he called me. He said, you know, it's Andy. I met you in the, in the bathroom. I said, yeah. He said, look, I'm, I've just been thinking about what you're talking about. I said, yeah. He said, so why do you think I'm not getting the best results? He said, oh, there's, there's numerous reasons. He says, oh, okay, what are they? He says, oh, well, I can't really tell you over the phone. He says, can we get together? I said, sure. So we got together and had a bit of a chat, him and Phil, the best mates. So we started training. So the first thing I did, I took them back to two sessions a week. And they went back to, um, so they weren't emotionally ready to go back to one session a week. Because there's this emotional change. It's religious. So I took them back to two sessions a week. One session was lower body and the other session was upper body. And all I gave them were for lower body was basically squats, lunges, and that's probably about it. Only half hour sessions. And the upper body was you know, two push and two pull exercises. And they train hard. Well, they thought they did anyway, until they started training with someone who started pushing them. But what was amazing is that straight away, they started putting in muscle. It was almost instantly. Why did they start putting in muscle? Because they had recovery. Because when, when does the callus develop if you're always rubbing it? You've got to let the callus Recover, you've got to let the skin recover and develop a tan, not just keep burning it or rubbing it. So within a matter of months, both of them went from 65 kilograms to around about 70 kilograms. So they put on five kilograms within probably about five months. So they're really happy. And their goal was to get the 75 because they were ninjas. <laughs> well, they were right to the martial arts and that. So they wanted to be really strong, good looking ninjas. However, they hit a plateau. They hit a plateau and I couldn't quite get them off 70 kilograms. Now, if you're training an ectomorphic type of person who's naturally really skinny, if you can put 10 kilograms on them, you're doing very well. If you're training someone who's more uh, mesomorphic, muscular, you can probably whack on 20 kilos. So with the experience, if someone's mesomorphic, I could probably get 20 kilos on you over time naturally. Unnaturally, you can put a lot more on that very quickly. But if it's you know, for someone who's ectomorphic, maybe 10 kilos. So someone who's 65 kilograms, I can probably get to 75, approaching 80. If you're mesomorphic, I can probably get you up to probably 90 kilo. Right? That's just purely anecdotal from just training many thousands and thousands of people. Because people sometimes have massive expectations. It's not that you drop them, but you just evolve them over time. But they tend to hit this part around 70 kilograms. And I, I sort of didn't know what to do. I, said, I was trying everything, trying variation, changing your reps, and I've tried every train technique you can, you can name. I've, I've done it in the, my journey. And sometimes you have to do what, you, what, you, what doesn't work to realize that it doesn't work. But another epiphany happened, a learning curve happened, was when Phil said to me, he says, look, I'm, I'm going to be going over to um, Canada for three months. Uh, I'm going, I said, why well, are you going to Canada? And his words was, I'm going to chase girls. So I believe the Canadians love Australians. And so I'm going to Canada. I said, well, fair enough. Okay. He says, I've also got my American Express card. I just got an American Express card. Going to Canada. So now Andy was left with me to train by myself. Both of them were a little bit frustrated because they couldn't get off that 70 kilograms. So they were both hovering around 70 kilograms. So Phil took off. And before he took off, I said, so, so, Phil, so you don't waste all that training. While you're over there, Make sure you, you keep training. 
But I know you're on holiday, so at least do one good strong session, which we do by yourself. Go on there to the gym, flog yourself really hard, because I really pushed them hard, but only do it once, once a fortnight. That way you're at least going to keep the muscle that you've put on, so when you come back we can start building on it. And he says, okay, I can do that. So I'm training with Andy. Now Andy couldn't afford to train with me twice a week because I had to split the cost. So Andy can only train me once a week. So what we used to do is I would train Andy legs on Tuesday. He'd do upper body by himself on Thursday. The following week he'd do legs by himself on Tuesday and upper body with me on Tuesday. So we used to alternate each week. So I, I kept hitting different parts of his body. Over the three months, Andy went from 70 kilograms. He, he put on another five kilos. He went up to about 75 kilograms. And I had no understanding why. Oh, but I did take the credit. <laughs> No understanding why, but he's, he's really happy with that. Phil came back after three months, and he came back weighing 76 kilo. Like, he was pretty buffed. And lean, because they're both ectomorphic, you know, they've got veins on top of veins, you know, they the cuts in their forehead. And, so he came back 76 kilo, lean and solid. I said, well, what have you been doing? He says, well, I've just been doing what you told me to do. Train once every two weeks, go in there, buff up, and eat up a lot, and chase women. All right, fair enough, well done. Okay. I said, Andy's done really well. You know, he's been training you twice a week and he's been doing that you know, all, all, all the sessions. And, and, and Andy says, well, well, okay, man. I said, what? He said, I have to be honest with you. I said, what's that? He says, I, I haven't been doing it. He says, what are you talking about? He says, well, I train with you, yeah, but you know that session I'm supposed to do by myself? He said, I said, yeah. He says, I haven't been doing it. I said, why not? He says, because it's boring <laughs> by myself. Why didn't you tell me? Because I know you get angry. <laughs> so in essence, what Andy was doing was upper body one week, lower body the next week. Upper body one week, lower body the next week. So how often was he hitting a body part? Fortnightly. By accident. I had none not planned this at all. And it reminded me of when I, after speaking, training Ian, when Ian was only training once a week, once every two weeks, I went back to my other 40 clients I was to train a week, I used to do one hour sessions back then, and I had six other trainers doing another 160 sessions. But with, with my clients, I'm going to experiment a bit. So what I used to tell them is, train with me once a week and go to your own gym the other two times a week. So what I share with them, instead of going to the gym and doing those other weight training sessions, go and do some cardio, and let's just try doing one weight training session a week. Look, I know you're getting fantastic results. Things are going really well. But how about we just try this out? And you know what most of them said? Well, you know those other two sessions I'm supposed to be doing? I said, yes, yeah. says, we have me doing them. Why not? Because they're boring. So by accident, they were getting the results by training once a week when I was thinking they were training three times a week. So a lot of the, my clients taught me a lot of things when I was embedded with what everyone else is doing, but rather than observing what my clients are doing and looking at the results. So when it comes to frequency of training, it's, it's looking at how, change your mindset, different philosophy. It's not how much I have to do, it's how little I have to do to get the result that I desire. So how much I have to do, it's how little I have to do to get the results that I desire. One session a week, I was interesting the other day I was flicked channel surfing and Oprah was on. Now I was a fan of Oprah and you know I don't mind Oprah sometimes, you know, some of the stuff's good. And, but there was, she had this doctor on there, her doctor consultant, and what was blessing to my ears is he looked at the, the ten major things people should do to have a healthy lifestyle. And you know what he put on there? Strength training. And that's that's just sensational. But you know what's even more sensational? How often did he recommend it? One half hour session a week. One half hour session a week, that's all you need. Just to acknowledge that strength training is anti-aging and good for health is fantastic. But he's not coming out saying three, four times a week because people are not going to do three, four times a week. Bodybuilders may want to do three, four times a week, but the general population are not going to do it. Okay, so frequency training, it's not how much you do, it's how. Now, some people may want to split it. So we look at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you have some people split, you ever heard about split programs? You know, they do uh, a chest on Monday and they do back on Tuesday and legs on Wednesday and shoulders on Thursday and arms on, on Friday. So they split the body up. Let me ask this, how many days is that person training arms? Every day. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm only doing arms on the Friday, but what do you work when you do your shoulders? Arms. What are you doing when you're in back? 
Arms, what do you do when doing chest? Arms. So how many sessions is your arms getting? Bison and tries? Four times a week. Now what's the limiting factor in your performance in your bench press? Your big muscles or your little muscles? Little ones. So the limiting factor in the bench press is your tricep. Limiting factor in the chin up is your bicep. So if you're doing arms, 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 by the time you get to your big exercises, what's the limiting factor in the performance of your big exercises? The little muscles. Why? Because they've been bombarded throughout the week. You're wondering why your bench press is not getting stronger because your weak links are getting weaker and weaker because you're rubbing the little ones which are more sensitive than the big ones. How many rotator right cuff exercises you got in there? Rotator right cuff, rotator right cuff, rotator right cuff, rotator right cuff. Because every movement using the glenohumeral joint works your rotator right cuff because it's a major stabiliser, the stabiliser of the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity and keep it nice and stable. And you express a lot of force through that, then you put a lot of stress on the rotator cuff. What's the number one injury that people get in, in, in the shoulder injury? Rotator right cuff. It's interesting, when I work with the National Baseball League, at the start, when I first I had spent six years working with Major League Baseball and National Baseball, at the start I used to get the guys to train three times a week. At the end of the six years, how often were they training? Once a week. At the start, what are they always getting? Rotator cuff injuries. At the end, who's getting rotator cuff injuries? No one. The other thing I observed, the people who did rotator cuff exercises got rotator cuff injuries. <laughs> The people who didn't do rotator cuff exercise didn't get rotator cuff injuries. Because how much rotator cuff are they getting in their weights? Lots. How much are they getting when they do baseball? Lots. So why would you go and do extra rotator cuff stuff when the rotator cuff is getting bombarded every day, every week? So particularly for an athlete, you can actually decrease their sporting life by overtraining them on the gym. A lot of the injuries that happen on the court, on the field, in the pool start in the gym. You don't want to be adding to the challenge. The strength training is to reduce injury, not enhance it. And many times the way people train, they enhance it. If you're doing three times weight training sessions a week, plus you're doing sport or playing tennis or baseball or cricket, then what you're doing is adding to the challenge. Make sure you're not adding to it. And you, 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 the best way to do that is to make sure you know your anatomy and physiology. Look at the overall stresses that go through the body and say, what is going to be the weak link in this journey? So, interesting, some people want to split it. Uh, Calder, from, um, a researcher from Canada in the Canadian Journal of Physiology, looked at two groups over a 21-week um, uh, period, which is almost half a year. One group did a full body program. One group did a split program. So one group trained twice a week full body. The other group trained four times a week split program. They did the same volume of work, but split, split over, and found that after the 21 weeks, both groups increased their strength, both groups increased their muscle tissues. Both groups, re both groups reduced body fat to the s pretty much significantly at the same level. So both got the good results, but there was no difference between the two groups. So the group that did split programs got no better results than the group that did a full body program. So looking at that, the only difference between the two is one had to train twice as often as the other. Now the adherence to the program, which group had more dropouts out of the program? Split. The split. But you've got no more results but more drop-offs. So don't stretch it out, condense it in. Condense it in, because you stretch it out, you, you're going to be taking out over, you're taking over other people's um, life, activities. Don't try to wedge their life into the program, wedge the program into their life. It's a different philosophy. And when I was 20 years of age and I was a bodybuilder, then my life was bodybuilding and I expect everyone else to be it. Make sure that your goals there don't interrupt other people's lives. Okay, so frequency training. Let's move on to exercise. But how about we give you a quick 10-minute break? Coffee, tea, pee, and a wee? <laughs> cool bananas?